Do you need supernatural strength to face something that's here or ahead? In this Bible study, I'm going to show you how to position yourself to receive all that God's got for you. The full armor of God is not for you to put on to have a bloodbath or a fight with a devil that's defeated, but to stand in the victory of the one that defeated him. You are not defined by the ways that you fall or by the ways that you're weak or the ways that you struggle. And God doesn't define you that way either. Have you ever started something and shortly after you got into it, you realize I am way in beyond my ability. I'm in over my head. I don't know how I can do this. I don't have what it takes to accomplish this responsibility. You're looking at somebody that gets myself into those things more often than I care to admit, especially when it comes to home projects. I always get in my head something that I think I can do on my own. I get deceived by this notion that, oh, that'll be easy. That looks easy. I think I can do that. I'll save some money. I'll just do it myself. And then I get into it and I regret it. And it's too late to back out. It's already halfway done. So then I just have to see it through. Probably one of the greatest experiences of feeling beyond my own ability was while writing my first book here, Silent Satan. You know, the book writing process can be a very fascinating process. It just brings about every insecurity in you, especially for the first one. I mean, it's this roller coaster of emotions. The, pro the proposal process, you know, if they decide to go through it, which that can be its own misery, but when you finally get through that, then you're excited because I get to write a book. And you're daunted because I got to write the book. <laughs> and, you know, staring down a blank page can look like a huge mountain sometimes. And certainly the devil will take even those very small things in our lives, magnify them into this huge thing to get us to shrink back in fear and keep us back from what God is asking us to do. But if you're going to do something, there's no way around it, over it, under it. You just have to go through it. It's like that children's song about the bear. You ever sing it? It goes, we're going on a bear hunt. We're going to catch a big one. It's a beautiful day. We're not scared. Oh, no. A big, dark forest. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We're going to have to go through it. And that really describes the process of a lot of the things that we get ourselves into, doesn't it? We're going to do this. We're going to build this ministry. We're going to start this business. We're going to get into this marriage. <laughs> We're going to write this book. <laughs> it's a beautiful day. All's going to go well. We're not scared. And then the obstacles show. And then you analyze it. If you're anything like me, you overanalyze it from every single angle. Okay, how do, can I go under it? Can I go over it? Oh, no, I'm just going to have to go through this. I am going to have to see this thing through. <laughs> And that's where you either shrink back in fear and you stay where you are or you push through in Jesus' name, scared stiff often, but you do it. Well, so here I am in the latter part of my first book. I understand. I was given three and a half months or so to write the book, not a lot of time. And by contract, it has to be a certain amount of words. And the devil's then telling me through it that you're not good enough. You don't have enough to say. Might as well just give up. And I mean, it's funny. The name of the book is Silent Satan. And I was silencing Satan the whole time while writing the book. Okay, so I lived this stuff out. And at the height of it all, the deadline is looming. My mind feels spent. I feel like I'm all out of words. Nothing more. What, what more can I say? Finally, I sat at my desk one afternoon, similar to this, and I lifted my hands up in surrender, and I protested, really, protested, God, I can't do this. I have come to the end of myself. You know what I felt God say at that point? Well, it's about time. I've been waiting for you to get there. It's where I wanted you to get all along. It was coming to the end of myself. That meant I was beyond my ability, my words, my thoughts, my strength. 
I was no longer in control, but was entirely dependent upon God's Spirit. And that, my friend, can be a very scary place to be. Beyond your control. (laughs) It'll make you want to run back to where you were in control. But you know what? Within just minutes, I think, of that surrender, I got an illustration that gave me the inspiration I needed to keep writing. And really, from that day forward, I mean, I still do this today. When I sit down to write, I'll say, okay, God, let's go. It's just you and me, and I need a whole lot more of you than me in this. And of course, God is always faithful to provide just what I needed. But in that moment, the anxiety just didn't automatically leave or never come back. And we have to understand that the obstacles that we face often will come back at times. They will rear their ugly heads again. So the victory isn't that they vanish. It's that we've learned something so that we can get through them when they do come back. And maybe as backwards as it sounds, it was that surrender that gave me the strength to finish everything that I needed to do in that project. I'm going to go more into this idea of surrender and what you have to do in your surrender in the latter part of this message. But let me ask you, do you feel weak, weary, worried, weighted by something you face right now or something that's up ahead, a deadline? test, a trial. You have to put on a smile through pain or be in the presence of a painful person, which can be very, very tough too. Does it feel like you've been thrown in the deep end before you've even learned how to swim? And guess what? You're in a really good place. What do you mean, Kyle? This isn't very much fun. This doesn't feel like a good place. It means that you've arrived at an opportunity. you got to see it that way. You've arrived at an opportunity to truly surrender and experience God's power. God's power to face what you never thought you could face, to do what you never thought that you could do. And yeah, there's no way around it. No way under it, no way over it. If you're going to do it, you got to go through it. But as you do. The promise of God's strength and power through it is that you don't have to stress and fear and faint as you go through whatever he's asked you to do. You know, in over their heads is probably the position that the apostles found themselves in just after Jesus ascended into heaven. Just imagine their insecurity. Jesus had just told them that they're going to heal the sick. They're going to cast out devils. They need to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. You know, just a few small little things, right? With Jesus there, that stuff was all kind of easy. They could kind of sit back and say, okay, Jesus, we'll just watch you do it. Because their track record when he wasn't there was pretty lousy. Think about it. They were crippled in fear in a boat when a storm came. They failed to cast out a demon from a deaf boy or a mute boy. They fell asleep when Jesus went to go pray in the garden, okay? So they weren't so great when he wasn't there. So I'm sure they were all worried and wondering, how can we do this without him here? We don't have the strength. We don't have the power. But you know, Jesus never intended for them to do it on their own. And that's the same mistakes that we make. We think that we got to do this on our own. God calls us to something. And then we set out to go do it, especially those of us driven people. I'm one of them. I'm not careful. I can get 10 steps ahead of God. I'm like, okay, God, I got the plan. I get it. I see where we're going. I'm going to start out and I'll check in with you if I got any problems. Well, guess what? The problems then come. And I realize I can't do this on my own. And as I said, God's not asking us to do this on our own. He's really just asking us to be the hands, the feet, the mouth. But he'll be the source and the strength. To move the hands and the feet, it'll be the words that come out of the mouth. And that's really what Jesus promised his apostles before he ascended into heaven. In Acts 1, 4 through 5, he says, Wait for the promise of the Father, that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In verse 8, he says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And maybe you recall the rest of the story. The apostles then gather in a place to wait for this power to come. And they didn't know what it was going to look like. 
They didn't know when it was going to happen. They really didn't have any details about it except that it would come from God. So they had no other choice but to wait, and they waited. And then, within power, or within days, the power came. With wind, fire, and frenzy, God's Holy Spirit swept through, filled them all with a new boldness, a new language, a new energy, a new drive that they never had before. And from that point on, it was full speed ahead. Much more than it was when they were with Jesus, actually. It's so interesting. That is so much more after Jesus was gone, after he had ascended to heaven, than they did before, but now filled with God's power in them, it wasn't so stressful. Now, understand, the power of God to do the impossible wasn't just something only for this select group in the early church. No. It's good news. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would be an advocate for all believers forever. And there's something at the end of the book of Acts, it's kind of hidden, that gives us a clue that we too should pursue that same power, that same strength that they did. Check this out. I think it's fascinating, really. As we just saw, Acts begins with a commission to reach the ends of the earth. And the remainder of the book is really the story of their progress made possible by God's power through Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. But Acts closes with Paul imprisoned in Rome, obviously short of the ends of the earth. Now, Luke, who wrote Acts, would have known the rest of the story, so why didn't he share it? A lot of scholars believe that the answer lies in a literary technique used in those days, which leaves off the ending so that the reader continues it in their life. Remember those choose-your-own-ending books maybe you read as a kid? Well, this wouldn't be a choose-your-own-ending, but it's a you-be-the-ending. Think of that next time you read the book of Acts, what that means for you. is really huge. Luke would have intended to convey that you and I are to continue the works of Jesus through the same supernatural strength and power of the Holy Spirit that they depended upon in the early church. You're as called to impossible tasks as the first apostles. You're as called to Christ's commission as they were. And you're as able to overcome the obstacles in your way of it as they were because you have access to the same power that they had. Romans 8, 11. I love this. It says, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit that's in you. Listen. To face and do the impossible, to do the greater works that Jesus said that we would do, you don't have to be God. Praise God for that, right? You just have to let him in and take control. Go to Philippians 4.13. It's a favorite verse, probably one of the most quoted verses. It's on jewelry and painted on sports figures, faces, wall art. It's Paul boasting. I can do all things because of Christ who strengthens me. Now, this verse is misused by a lot of people often to bolster this idea of self-empowerment, that we can do whatever we set our minds to do. And that's why it's often so quoted. I can ace this test. I can lose this weight. I can win this game. I can get this job. A lot of I cans, eyes, and a lot of those statements. But really, Paul's intent was different when you read it in context, which you can see in the first few verses before it. Philippians 4, 11 through 12, Paul's saying, I do not speak because I have need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know both how to face humble circumstances and how to have abundance. Everywhere and in all things I have learned the secret, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then after saying all of that, that's when Paul says, I can do all things because of Christ who strengthens me. So Paul wasn't talking about self-empowerment and being able to turn into a Superman, able to bust out of the prison he wrote this in. Really what Paul's talking about is how Christ's spirit in him gave him the strength 
to endure the difficulties and the challenges of his calling. Now, some of you I know are thinking, well, that doesn't sound so fun. I don't know that I like that. Well, yeah, it might not seem a whole lot of fun because, yeah, we'd love for God to just do whatever we want. But God's power is meant to help us achieve what he's called us to do, what he wants, with the joy of contentment and the assurance that he will finish what he starts. And really, that is of great encouragement. Think about this. It means that if God calls you into ministry, he will provide the funds and the opportunities. If God asks you to stay in a difficult job, situation, relationship, he'll provide the grace to stick it out with a hopeful attitude Not just grumbling every day. I don't know why I have to deal with this mess all the time. (laughs) If God asks you to give beyond your means, he'll provide the finances to meet your needs. If you have to raise a child by yourself, God will provide the physical and emotional support you need to do it successfully. If you're in a crisis or a challenging circumstance, God will provide the wisdom to help you navigate through it. So what is it that you have to do? Know that whatever it is, God never planned for you to do it on your own. Hear this. This is good. You got to hear this. God will do the heavy lifting if you will just do the heavy trusting. Now, your three simple but sure steps to position yourself to receive God's power. And these are life tested, okay? These are lessons that I learned through some of the more daunting moments of my ministry and life so far. But they're also what's modeled through the stories that we just read of Paul and of the apostles. Step one, surrender striving. There's no other choice. You have to give up trying to make everything happen on your own. And now some of you, I know you're turned off at this point right now. You say, I can't give up control. I need to be in control. Well, Father, in Jesus' name, break off their need of control. Come on, this is good news. Your strength is a limited resource. You're not called or created to be all things to all people, nor to do all things on your own. You were created to be dependent upon God's spirit. And that's good news because his spirit is an unlimited source of power and strength. So the first step of supernatural strength is you got to lift your hands and surrender like I did during my book writing process. And you got to say, okay, God, I can't do this on my own. I need your strength. Some of you should do that right now. Father, help them. Help them to truly get to the point to where they can give it up and give it to you, God. And if they're not ready to get to that place, I pray that you would do something to get to them, get them to that place as painful as it might be. <laughs> because I promise you, when you finally get to the place of surrender, that is the place of your freedom. That is the place of your strength. Now, after your surrender, you have to immediately go into step two. And that's to ask to be freshly filled with the Holy Spirit. And the key word here is freshly. Yeah, I know if you're a Christian, then the Holy Spirit entered you at the moment of your salvation. Absolutely. But the Bible does teach that you can be filled and saturated with the Spirit's power on a continual basis. This was actually the source of the disciples' ongoing strength. Look at Acts 13, 52. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you, when is the last time you've asked for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit? I try to make it a practice to ask for this as often as I can or as often as I remember. It'd be something great to add to your morning prayers. It can just be as simple as, Father, I ask for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit, saturate me with your presence. Fill me with your power. Strengthen me to do what I need to do today. And then after you've prayed that, be sure that you've received it. The Bible says God gives his Holy Spirit to whoever asks for it. So you have to be confident, go about your day confident that God has filled you afresh, even if you don't immediately feel like it, because sometimes you won't. You just have to take a step and stand that God has done what he has promised to do. Step three. Wait in expectation for God's power to come. 
If you haven't tuned into my message on the law of expectation, and I encourage you to check it out after this one, go to my website, kylewinkler.org, search for the law of expectation. It'll give you a good foundation for what biblical expectation really means. But at Jesus' ascension, he instructed his disciples to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit who would come to enable them to do what he asked them to do. But like I said, they had no idea of when this would happen or what this would look like. So they had to wait with expectation and trust. And as they waited, in just a matter of days, they got the power. They got the power. (laughs) They were instantly able to do what they couldn't do before. Many years before, the prophet Isaiah actually spoke about this principle of expectant waiting too. In Isaiah 40, verse 31, it's a familiar verse for a lot of us. It says, But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. That's an incredible promise, really, when you think of it. God doesn't say, you might find new strength. He promises that you will. So like the disciples, all you have to do is wait in expectation of it. And now I understand that waiting can be hard. It can be some of the hardest things to do is to wait for God to do what only he can do. But Father, I pray right now that you will renew patience in them to wait on what you have coming for them, to wait for your strength and power, to wait so they don't go out and try to do all this stuff on their own and get stress. So remember, this is a key reminder here. Real breakthrough happens when you stop depending on what you can do and start trusting in what God will do in spite of you. God promises you his power. He promises you strength when you're weak, that you can do whatever he asks you to do. You can face whatever you have to in Jesus' name. You really can. So let's activate this promise right now with a declaration. Let's activate the word. Declare this with me. Say it. Really mean this. I can do whatever God wants me to do because the Spirit of Christ is in me. I am filled with the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. And I am empowered to do the greater works that he promised. Christ in me gives me strength when I'm weak, clarity when I feel confused, the right words when I need them, hope when I feel discouraged, joy when I'm weary, and the ability to do whatever God asks me to do. Thanks for tuning in. I just taught out of my chapter, I can do whatever God wants me to do. Go more in depth on this topic and explore 15 more of God's promises just like this one in my book, Activating the Power of God's Word. Get your signed copy today at kylewinkler.org slash activate book. And by the way, to get all my latest YouTube content, be sure to click the subscribe button at the bottom right of this video.